This is the Mark Dolan Way. Top tips for mind, body and soul, some great life hacks and my favourite products of the week. This show is available on all podcast platforms or you can watch it. Just subscribe to the Mark Dolan Way on YouTube and join the Facebook group. Enjoy. Hello and welcome to the show. I hope you're very well. Let's talk about guilt. It's a double-edged sword. In some ways, it's very useful because it stops you doing things like murdering people. You want to murder Dave, but then you're thinking, oh, you know, Dave's a great guy. He's got a couple of kids. He's very popular. If I murdered Dave, it would be just, oh, God, Do you know what I mean? And the guilt stops you. I mean, you would like to murder Dave. You'd like to dispatch of him, but those emotions are are pushing back. And that's healthy. That's a good thing. Because let me tell you, murder is rubbish. Okay. The Mark Dolan Way podcast has an official position, a view of murder, which is that we don't like it. It's a net negative. It's a thanks, but no thanks. However, in lots of other ways, guilt is a rubbish emotion because it just stops you getting on with your life. We all make mistakes. And it's terribly important that we learn from those mistakes and endeavor not to repeat them. But what a lot of people do, and I've been guilty of this myself, um, is dwelling on mistakes of the past and allowing that to influence future outcomes. So here's what you do with regard to guilt. Here is how you own guilt. Here's how you defeat guilt and get on top of it and stop it being a negative emotion. Two words. Forgive yourself. That's right. We all make mistakes unless it's mass murder. And I think therefore forgiveness is hard. I think the mistakes you've made, you've got to just have peace and say, that was bad. I'm going to learn from it. I'm going to have different ways of making sure I don't do that again. But it happened. I can't roll back time. I forgive myself. So that's what I want you to do. I want you to forgive yourself. It is the ultimate superpower. Learn from your mistakes. Forgive yourself. Because if you don't, you'll never be able to move on. So I hope you're very well. I hope things are good with you. Um, I love this. This is just a random thing that happened to me this week. I've got to tell you that for ages now, maybe over a year, I've been looking for swimming shorts with a zip on them. And let me explain. You know, these men's swimming shorts and it's sort of like a kind of polyester pair of shorts. And then there's this kind of mesh stuff inside which holds, it, it, it harnesses your uh, your crown jewels, doesn't it? it? It harnesses your reproductive organs. I won't go further than that because this is a family show. And I pride myself on the fact that the Mark Dolan Way is a program that you can have on in the car. It could be on in the kitchen when the kids are playing and you don't have to worry because everybody's safe with Uncle Mark. So let's just say crown jewels are harnessed in this mesh and you've got the, uh, you've got the shorts and very often they have a, a pocket on either side, which is open. And then you've got a pocket on the back, which is essentially open and closed with a little square of Velcro. I think you know what I mean. A little Velcro holds the back pocket shut. Now, this is no good if you're on holiday, because what about the pickpockets? I mean, that is a dreamland for them. That's a bonanza, isn't it? You need something a little more closable. Also, I'm short sighted and I've got this thing. I'm a bit unusual in that I love to swim in the sea or a lake with my glasses on. That's right. I swim in my glasses. You're welcome. And the reason why is I'm short sighted. And if I swim without my glasses, I can't see the beautiful landscape, you know, the hills and the mountains around the lake and my loved ones. I can't recognize them from a distance. So I like to have my spectacles on whilst I'm swimming. But I can't dive or jump into the water with my glasses on because then they will be scooped off my face and lost forever, which happened to a pair of glasses of mine about 10 years ago, and I still miss them. Do you ever get that, by the way? Do you get items that you either lose or get stolen or can't find, and you just still miss them? Oh, man, I think that's a, that's a whole podcast, isn't it? The items that you still miss. I tell you, I miss those glasses. They were, in fact, two, I've lost two sets of glasses at the beach. Once when I had my glasses on, they were lovely. These, they were tortoiseshell frame, lovely shape. And they got scooped off my, off my face, off my head. 
with a wave. The wave just crashed, knocked the glasses off, and they were gone forever. Another time, I just was sunbathing in Edinburgh, which, by the way, that's very rare. I think you'll agree. But there's a very nice beach outside Edinburgh called Portobello. And I got the one good sunny day of the year. And I took my glasses off and I was sunbathing and messing around with mates. And then when I came to sort of pack my stuff up, rolling my towel and couldn't find the glasses, they were just lost in the sand. You don't want to lose things in the sand. Miss those too. Things that you still miss. There's so many. I mean, there's a lot of stuff I reckon I still miss that I've lost. But hopefully I've edited most of, the, most of it that have been forgotten, which is useful. Anyway, so I like to swim in the sea with my glasses and I can't dive in. If the pockets of my shorts are open and I don't trust the Velcro, because what I would do is I'd put the glasses in my back pocket and I'd close them with the Velcro. But would you trust Velcro with your spectacles? And also the way I dive into the water, I'm like, I'm like a, um, I'm like a young dolphin, the way I dive. Do you know what I mean? I, I'm like a killer whale almost, you know, I, I, I'm such a unit. The way I hit the water is there's a real craft to it and a power, obviously, and a strength. And it's just quite something that when I come back up, I go I go deep down and I blow air out of my snout, just like a dolphin. And then I scoop back up out of the waves and I'm, I dive in and out. And the water rolls off my naked torso. The sun glistens on my muscular shoulders and let me I'll be honest with you I cut quite the figure in the sea as I dolphin in and out of the water uh, and it, there's no way that the glasses are going to stay in the back pocket of those swimming shorts which are held together by bloody velcro for god's sakes I mean what is velcro it's a kind of children's craft material isn't it it's a toy velcro do me a favor it's not substantial it's not trustworthy and it gets uh, too much publicity for me, Velcro. Like those Velcro shoes. You remember those shoes at school and the you wouldn't have laces. You would just have these straps, the Velcro straps. And if, do you remember how they just like started to curl over? After about six months, it gets a bit curly. And they, they curl away from the Velcro itself. Rubbish. I didn't realise until I started this show how furious I am about Velcro. I'm absolutely furious with velcro how dare they we've been duped haven't we is there any good use for velcro well we'll talk about it in time um, i do quite like the idea you can get these products now where you can hang something not that heavy using velcro so you've got an adhesive velcro thing and you stick it to the wall and then you maybe put the other velcro part let's say on the back of a picture and then you can just velcro it to the wall i quite like that because you don't have to do any drilling and stuff so maybe that's all right for Velcro. But anyway, I'm not having it as a as a as a mechanism by which you secure closed the back pocket of swimming shorts. So what I need is I either need a good button, a couple of buttons, or I need a zip. And I prefer the zip because I worry that with a single button on the back pocket, the glasses could still sneak out. Because don't forget the way that I swim in that water, the way that I dive in is is like. It's like something out of Jaws. Do you know what I mean? It is. Or Free Willy. So. They didn't think that through, did they, when they came up with that name? They didn't think it through. It's just one more meeting and they could have got that one resolved. But it remains unresolved, doesn't it? So. What am I going to do? So anyway, I've spent, I have honestly spent a lot of time uh, in shops looking for shorts with a zip, which will hold my glasses into the back pocket as I dive into the water like some kind of prehistoric water-based mammal. And I've not really found them. And I did see one pair and they were very expensive. And I, I don't think that Swimming shorts is a premium item. I don't think that you should splash the cash on swimming shorts. No, no pun intended. I probably didn't like the design either. Even though I'm quite lean, I, I tried on those shorts and they somehow made me look fat. You ever get clothes that just look terrible? doesn't matter. I, 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 you could probably have this perfect body, but it's somehow very unflattering. 
I had this kind of weird belly overhang on them. And I, I, I don't really have a belly, but I, I looked like some kind of absolute reprobate dad bod, total slob fatso in these shorts. So I didn't buy them. They're too expensive. They were not flattering is all I'm saying. And anyway, the search goes on, right? The search goes on because you know about this program. We don't give up, do we? We do not give up. We're like a dog with a bone. And I often say to you, whatever your project is, stick with it. Right? Well, remember, remember, Woody Allen, 95% of success is turning up. It's just relentless. You don't give up. You just go again. You go again. You go again. So I've kept that philosophy with the swimming shorts. Anyway, um, the other day I had to go swimming and I was in a real hurry. I was in a hurry. So I had to go for a quick swim, which is very nice. And I, I've got a kind of basket of clothes that I do not love. OK, it's just horrible, crappy things that should go to charity that has either got holes in from moths or slightly torn or they've lost their original colour. They're all washed out and just bad clothes. I've got this sort of basket of bad clothes. And I was like, I need to deal with this at some point. It's clothes that I don't love. It's bad clothes. Anyway, so I'm 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 in the bad bad clothes box, and I remember there's some crappy old swimming shorts in there, like the very worst. And so what I've done is I've I've grabbed those, okay, at high speed, and I've held them in contempt. I mean, literally, I've, I've got them. I'm like, Ugh! But I need to go swimming quickly. You notice you're in a hurry. There there isn't time to go and get the nicer ones. Just get the crap ones. So I get these things. They're pink, whatever. I think they cost. I'm not even lying. I think they cost about three quid from Primark. Um, which is a very cheap British store. And they, they almost gave them away. So that's fine, right? So um, I go to the pool and I pull them on and I, I, I rush off to the diving board. And I'm, I'm going to put my uh, take my glasses off. Uh, what I've got to do, by the way, because I don't have adequate, correct swimming shorts to accommodate my glasses whilst I dive like some kind of remarkable sea-based urchin. Right. Almost like the. What's that thing in Scotland? The Loch Ness Monster is what I'm like in the water because I've got I, I go up and down. Exactly. My body is exactly like that. It goes up and it goes down and up and down. I do not have the correct shorts. So what I do is I leave my glasses next to the diving board. I dive in and then I swim to the edge where the diving board is, and I put my glasses on manually and then I just swim around, right? What a compromise. So anyway, I'm just about to do that. I'm about to take my glasses off, put them on the side and dive. I look down at these terrible shorts, which I paid about three quid for. Oh my God. These shorts come with a frigging zip. They've actually got a zip. And wait for it. This is a mic drop, not just one zip but two zips okay so you know the pocket bit where you would put your hands if you were walking along like in your trousers the two front pockets there's a zip each side a really chunky solid reliable zip the moral of the story my absolute legendary friends is that i have spent the best part of two years looking for a pair of swimming shorts with a zip rather than velcro because of my sub aqua Olympian efforts in the sea because the forces are so strong it's just going to dislodge any velcro the shorts I hate are exactly the shorts I need it's got they got a zip on both sides and a back pocket with a button which is also better than velcro because you can't you're not gonna I wouldn't really trust my glasses there but I can probably put other things back there a whole potpourri of treats absolutely buzzing so these shorts have got the zip through and by the way very generous pockets how secure are the zips vice like vice like as strong and solid as they come also not a kind of crappy weedy little zip really chunky ostentatious zip like really in your face show offy sort of mic drop zip i can't tell you uh, they're pink the mesh inside them holds my crown jewels in the most elegant and unobtrusive way. So I celebrate. I take my glasses off. I put them into the right hand pocket. I zip them shut. 
I dive into the water like something out of Moby Dick. Okay. I mean, I, I hit that water with the power of both Sharon Davies and the American swimmer Michael Phelps combined. Was it Michael Phelps? Matthew Phelps? Who cares? That's showbiz love. Anyway, I can't believe it. So I dived in. I then can reach down to my pocket. I can unzip the ost ostentatious, excellent show off -y zip, take my glasses out, put them on and swim around. What is the point of this story? And I know you're asking that and you're only human, but it's actually massively important, which is very often what you're looking for, you've already got. OK. It might be your job and you're like, I want another job. I hate this. I hate that. I don't like Ray in accounts. He's got a very, very strange beady eyes, oversized ears. The nose is to, to the left. There's no symmetry in his face. I cannot handle Ray. I believe he steals from me. He smells, you know, so so maybe you've got a work situation. Maybe it's a relationship thing. I don't like Stephanie. I'd much rather be with Jill. <laughs> Very old school names. They both sound about 60. Um, I need to update my kind of mental library of women's names. I think I can do better than Stephanie and Jill. <laughs> is that Jill's a lovely name, but is there anyone under 100 called Jill? I don't think so. There's definitely no babies called Jill in 2023. Are there? There's, there is not a baby. If you if you can find me anyone that was born after 1990 called Jill, I will give you eight million pounds. I think Stephanie's still knocking about a little bit, but Jill is absolutely gone out of there. And I feel sorry for that. I might bring it back. I might actually make a girl and call her Jill just, you know, just to make a point, really. And I could explain to my daughter that her whole existence was basically because of this idea that I wanted to bring the name Jill back. Do you think she'd mind that, if that was her purpose on earth? That I was just settling scores with the name police? Right, listen, we need to straighten this out. Uh, I just am saying to you that notwithstanding the frivolity of my swimming shorts anecdote, whether it's a relationship, whether it's a work thing, whether it's where you live, whether it's the flat or house you're in, whether it's the computer you've got, whether it's the book you're reading, just be careful that you're not throwing away, throwing away something very valuable and that what you're looking for, you've actually got. Um, you might think I'm mad, but I've got proof of that, which is that you, you'll have been in relationships that you ended and then regretted ending those. Or you'll have left jobs and gone on to another job or dumped a friend or kind of just drifted away from a friend that was actually really amazing. And you're thinking, God, I'd, I'd have that job back or I'd work in that office again or I'd have that person back in my life. But I thought there was something more. The grass is always greener. And in fact, what I was looking for, I already had. Now, you get that sometimes. It's very sweet when people divorce and then remarry. I find that the most romantic thing imaginable because anybody can fall in love and get married and have a great party and that's standard, isn't it? But for somebody to do that, and then it, they then they, like they hate each other. So they, they fall in love, they get married, and they say, I hate you, I can't bear you. They have a long, angry divorce. They split their assets 50-50. Normally one of them takes a big old financial bath as a result. And that's all terrible, right? How romantic that those two people who have been to hell and back and through a painful divorce should then reconcile and say, do you know what? It was just, I couldn't live without you. It's that lovely song, can't live if living is without you. Can I quickly mention something, by the way? I don't think I recommend enough artistic material to you on this show. And you know that song, can't live if living is without you. Can't live, can't live anymore. I do hope I don't get sued by the brilliant songwriters of that song. Um, for singing it. But all I would say is I want to help the songwriters and say it's one of the most lovely love songs. 
and there are different versions of it and they're great. But the other day I heard a version and I don't know if it's the original or not, but it's by Badfinger. That's one word, Badfinger. Can I ask you after this podcast, would you do me a really big favor if you've got like streaming, if you've got Apple Music or something, but you can even you can even listen on YouTube for free, actually. But would you mind having a listen to um, Can't Live If Living Is Without You by Badfinger? Because it's not a, it's not the famous version. It's the Bad Finger version from about 1970. And it's I find it more emotional, less cheesy and very, very moving. And it's pared down. It's very spare. It's a very spare version. But I really, really love that song. And it's especially well done by Bad Finger. Anyway, but yeah, it's so romantic. The idea that you get divorced and then you remarry the same person. I mean, that is love, isn't it? Phil Collins is a regular feature of this show because he's somebody that defies the odds. He's a remarkable guy. And he got married twice. It's very romantic, sadly and hilariously. It actually didn't work out for him the second time. So he's actually divorced the same woman twice, which I think we could only describe as careless. So, Phil, you silly sausage, you've diluted my argument. But as a general rule, when people reconvene second time round, that's going to that's going to be it. So. If you're looking for something, you may already have it. So what I want you to do, what is the practical application of this? Because it's all I've spoken in very vague terms, haven't I? What is the takeaway here? The takeaway is. um, Look at every aspect of your life, your job, your family, your home, where you live, your computer, the book you're reading, whatever it is. And just evaluate and really think about the good stuff that it that it's got. Because we have this tendency to be very negative. You know, when you're tired and you're a little depressed and life is getting on top of you, everything looks bad. There's a really, really nice poem called The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner by, I think it's Wordsworth. I should know I have an A-level in English and it was literally a text I studied. So it's good that a couple of years later, I don't even know the name of the author. That's not great retention, is it, of information. But I think it was Wordsworth. The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner? Of course it was. And if not, well, then get over yourself. I'm so sorry. So it's a lovely little poem. poem. I'd recommend you read it if you can be bothered. No, it's lovely. Gorgeous little short stanzas. Very, very lyrical. And this dude, Wordsworth, um, he writes about this guy, the Ancient Mariner, and there's some bad stuff. I can't remember what it is in other detail, as you've probably noticed. But essentially, he has got this real negative emotion. And it's manifested that I don't know if Wordsworth was high on drugs when he wrote it. But what happens, something metaphysical happens to the, the sailor. Right. And metaphysical, what is that? It's it's kind of spiritual. It's not real. It's imaginary, like a ghost or something. Real but not real. Certainly not tangible. Anyway, so he, he's got this albatross which is hanging around his neck. And that's where I think the expression I've got an albatross around my neck comes from. So well done, Wordsworth, for um creating idiom that we still use to this day. And he's nasty and he's negative and all is bad. And when he looks in the sea, he just sees, see, you and I would see like lovely fish swimming around, but he sees snakes, right? So he's in such a negative mindset that he's looking at the lovely fish and they could be carp or salmon. Maybe they could be eels or haddock. Is haddock a fish or do you just eat that? Is is the haddock the bit of the fish that you eat? I think a haddock is a fish. I'm not going to lie. NGL, that means not going to lie with the first letter of each word, one after the other. Um, (laughs) I don't think I would like to be a haddock. Would you? I don't think it's one of the great. I don't think you sort of puff your chest out and go, hi, my name is my name is Alan and I am a haddock. I don't, you know, there's something very grand about being a sea bass. Do you know what I mean? My name is Sebastian. And I'm a sea bass. I am Sebastian the sea bass. I don't want to come back as a haddock. When you're a haddock, you know that you're a fish that British people would rather have cod than you, right? You're 
You are what British people eat when the cod has run out at the fish and chip shop. That's not great, is it? You don't want to be behind cod. Is cod a fish? I think so. Or is or is the cod just the bit you eat of a fish? I, know, I believe I believe that cod is a fish. Um, but he he's looking at these fish and they're normal fish, but what he sees is snakes. And it's because he's in a very negative mindset and it's very self-destructive because they're not snakes. And, and you know, you'll have been in this state where, where you become very negative. Maybe your mental health is not good. Maybe your physical health is not good. All is bad with the world. And you get in the grip of negativity. And the danger, therefore, is that you start looking for things that you've already got. And, you know, you're maybe not treating your partner very well and you're not nurturing that relationship and you're not giving as much to work as you could. You're turning up late and you're really phoning it in. You're not putting the effort in. You start hating work and then the boss complains because your work has gone down and everything is just bad. And you're looking at snakes. You're not looking at haddock or sea bass. You're not looking at Sebastian the sea bass. And that's dangerous. So what I want you to do is adopt a more positive mindset. And I want you to see Sebastian the sea bass, not Sven the snake. Uh, the, the snake. <laughs> He's not a steak. Imagine if there was an animal called a steak. I would eat that animal, I can't lie. Wouldn't it be great if fillet steaks were just one big animal? It's basically just a really large steak with legs and, and two eyes. I'm sure Bill Gates will concoct such a creature at some point for all of us to eat. Now, um, we are... So, I've got a call in coming. That's very unhelpful, isn't it? And wildly distracting. Um, before we go, let me talk to you about that. So, so that's it. You may already have it, what you're looking for. So look at every aspect of your life. And I want you to just actually focus on the positives. And if you can't find any, then it's time to move on. It's time to change job. It's time to end that relationship. It's time to stop reading that book. But just eke out the good stuff and even write it down if you want. And understand that the grass is not always greener. And sometimes what you want to do is keep what you've got and just invest more in it. And then more will come out. You know, what you put in, it's like a pension, isn't it? What you put in, it comes back, including in a relationship. You know, when I have relationship problems, I just, I, I mean, I try to put my back in it. I just try to make more of an effort. And then suddenly things change and things improve. I hosted a show called I'm Here to Help, in which people came on stage and talked to me about their problems. And the number of couples that could be very happy in principle, but the the male partner would just do things like leave a wet towel on the bed and she his partner's like can you not do that I and mean, he still does it it's like just, just don't leave a wet towel on the bed and then your relationship will improve it's amazing how trivial some of this stuff actually is now a few other things to tell you before we go um insoles most people pronate, and what that means is that they have flat feet and their feet sort of fall in, okay? It means the arch sort of collapses. I'm not a podiatrist, but that's, but that's sort of the headline. And if your feet go flat like that, it affects the entire alignment of your leg. So that means that your knee is affected and it ultimately can feed through to your back and your spine and all the rest of it. So in an ideal world, when we walk, as we step, there should be a nice little arch shape in our foot. Children have it, but a lot of us, when we get older, it flattens out. In the old days, if you had flat feet, they wouldn't let you in the military even. Can you imagine? So that's not very nice, is it? And um, so many people do that. So they, they pronate. Um, and then there are some people that it's called supination and they supinate, which is the opposite, where, where I think the, the foot sort of splays out and goes the other way. And it's a little bit like a spectrum. And I think most people have some kind of issue with it. You can go to your supermarket or your pharmacy and they will sell you these insoles. But the problem with them is that essentially it's it's very a blunt tool because it's not measured to your exact foot. And it essentially it'll be like an insole with a big lump where the arch is and it just sort of holds your arch up. I've tried those. and You just get friction under your arch, you just get like a blister. 
don't like it. So um, I went to a podiatrist and this was very good. And I just I think it's something for you to think about, especially if you get knee problems, you get joint pain. Um, and if, if you think you can manage it, um, sometimes you know, there's expensive versions, but it can be done cheaply as well. Mine was a sort of moderately priced. Uh, the consultation was 200 pounds which is a lot of money, but this is a life changing thing that I did. So what you do is you go and you have this consultation and this guy, he gets me to bring my normal shoes and he puts me on a treadmill and I walk and he's filming the back of my, he's filming the back of my legs as I walk on the treadmill. He then puts that video through his software and the software creates a prescription for me because what it does is it shows how much I'm my leg is falling in my foot is falling in how much I'm pronating and you basically so you're walking out of alignment with your the body's physiology right you're not there isn't that nice straight line the line bends and that affects your knees and everything else it's not good for the foot either so essentially he films you and he sees how out of kilter your instep is and then really simple with those measurements, he sends those measurements off to a company who then just generate one of these, which is a um, an, a plastic insole. Now, if you're listening, let me just say that it's a very sort of hard plastic insole and it's about half the size of a normal insole. And the way that it works is that it, it's shaped exactly to the way that your foot is not working. So it's a bit like your it's a bit like a prescription for your spectacles. Do you know what I mean? It's like everyone's got different vision. So the optician creates a lens which corrects the light going into your eye. Everyone's prescription is different. So it's the same with this. Everyone's going to be pronating to a different degree at a different angle. And what it does is it just straightens it out. And it mainly does that by building up around the heel because the heel is a solid bone. And if you build up the insole under the heel, the heel creates a natural arch in the foot but without actually artificially holding the arch up like those supermarket options and then the, the heel is built up it's a solid bone your foot that bone just sits on the insole and then you have basically have a nice arch in your foot and it's an amazing thing and they're called orthotics uh, if you're lucky enough to have private medical insurance you might be able to get that paid for but if it's something, especially if you're a runner or a skier or anything like that, it might be something that you could look into, especially if you feel that you've got like back pain or your knees ache when you're going running. Um, and as I say, most people, I've got to tell you, are a candidate for some kind of insole. What I also love about them is it means that I can now buy very cheap shoes and I put my insoles in and they become excellent shoes because the shape is perfect from the insoles. It doesn't really matter about the shoe. So they, they make bad shoes good. And I, I, as you might remember, I'm a big fan of the kind of barefoot style shoes. And if you haven't got a budget to buy barefoot style shoes, you just get normal shoes, take out the insole and then they're barefoot. That really works, especially well with Converse and brands like that to remove the insole. And then you can feel the ground under you and it's quite nice. But yeah, so that's it. It's the insoles thing. I used to get tired feet. I used to get achy knees, all that stuff. And I have not had that for 15 years. I've not had knee issues. It really is a spectacular game changer. And what was I going to say to you? It's very important. Uh, we've done the cheap shoes. We've done the knees. Oh, yeah. Um, what's lovely then is that you the, these ones are plastic. You keep them forever. right? There's no reason why they should really break. They're very robust. And your prescription doesn't change. So if you lose them, you just call the podiatrist that you've seen and just ask for another pair. And they'll knock out another pair. They won't. You don't have to keep measuring the foot or anything like that. It's just it's it's incurable, but fixable, um, which is very nice. And the other thing I'll say to you, proof um, of how good they are, is I I like skiing. I don't ski very well, but I do like skiing. And before I had these, I used to get terrible blisters on the side of my foot, awful blisters. And it's because my foot was falling in every time I turned on the skis because I got the flat feet. And ever since I put the insoles in, no blisters, because the foot lands exactly where it's supposed to as you're skiing. And that's proof 
It's proof of everything. And um, this is a particularly important device if you do a lot of walking, spend a lot of time on your feet at work, or if you run. Uh, and that would be that. A couple of other things to cover. First of all, the best things in life are free. I know a fitness guru who prefers to be anonymous. So let's call him Muhammad. And that's his actual name. So he'll be furious. And Muhammad says, beware of anything complicated or expensive when it comes to your health. And he's absolutely right. So what does he talk about? He talks about real food. You know, you don't need fancy potions. You have a piece of salmon. You have a boiled potato with a knob of butter, which is just the top bit from the milk of cows. You have an apple. You have a glass of what they call water, not some special elixir, you know, some kind of fancy rehydration solution. You've got H2O, baby. Doesn't get better than that. Uh, vitamin C, you know, if you do supplements and we'll do a special on supplements, but vitamin C is terribly good for you. It's not retained by the body. It just kind of, it, you excrete it. So it, it doesn't sit there uh, deposited as an ongoing resource. So vitamin C powder is brilliant. It's so cheap. I mean, I recently bought a massive, probably a kilo of vitamin C for about four pounds because it's cheap and it's simple and it, everyone knows it's good for you. It's not a fancy potion. So, you know, look out for you know, medications and concoctions uh, subscriptions where they this company is going to transform your health, but they need a million pounds a month. It's not good. So tying in with that simplicity of a good night's sleep, no caffeine after midday. Exercise. I mean, exercise is free. It doesn't cost anything. A press up is free of charge. Um, there's a really good book. Let me think what it's called. I really ought to know. Damn. It's along the lines of prison conditioning. I should look this up, shouldn't I? I will look this up because I owe that to you. Um, and the book is, it basically shows you what you can do to stay fit if you're in prison in a cell and you can't get out of the cell. And it talks about all the different press ups and pull ups you can do, body weight exercises. Uh, but basically, yeah, that's and, and actually the book became a bestseller because people that weren't in prison bought it because they um, found it useful. Let me have a look. Let me have a quick look. Let's go live onto the Internet. Prison conditioning. Exercise book. See, old Joe Rogan's got young Jamie. I. It's just me. There is no. Oh, there you go. I'm, at least I found it, though. I'm not as bad as I thought. Convict conditioning. How? So I'm coming off mic. That's not very professional, is it? Convict conditioning. How to bust free of all weaknesses using the lost secrets of supreme survival strength. By Paul Coach Ware. W-A-R-E. Convict conditioning. But that's it. So keep it simple when it comes to your health and your well-being. Seek out the things which are free or uncomplicated and unadulterated. Dr. As Asim Malhotra, who's a top cardiologist and the author of The P.O.P. Diet, which is a low carbohydrate sort of diet book based upon the Mediterranean diet of real ingredients. And he says, don't eat anything that's got more than five ingredients, which is a really good rule of thumb. So in keeping with my advice about free stuff, I mean, you could you could get fit without gym membership or without equipment by doing press ups and pull ups and sit ups and squats and star jumps and God knows what you could do everything in your living room. It's not a problem. Um, but anyway, I've got a really good one for you. It's terribly simple and it's to walk rather than get the bus or the train or even cycle. Cycling's great, but walking is marvellous. It's meditative. It's metronomic. You see the world around you. You engage with other people as you walk along. 
Uh, it's not going to wear out your knees. It's very easy on the body walking, but you do get an uptick in your heart rate. It's good for your cardiovascular. It's good for stress. It saves you money because walking places cost an out. Good for your mental and physical health. It's very good. Um, you might know from a previous show that I'm not a fan of eating late because I think eating late is really bad for you because you go to bed and you've just got all this stuff just sat there in your stomach, slowly going off in your belly. Don't like it. And I always feel rubbish the next day. If I do eat late for some reason by accident or there's some social reason or whatever, I will try to get out for a walk after dinner. In fact, walking after food is generally really nice and it's linked to better health. If you walk after your food, um, I think it stimulates the digestion. I think that it uh, reduces the insulin response to the food and it's just a good thing. It makes sense, doesn't it, to go for a stroll after a meal. So try that. But but walking is a big thing, getting out there. And it's amazing how we get out of the habit of it because we have bicycles, electric bikes now, e-scooters, buses, trains, cars, you name it. We don't really have to walk much at all, but we're missing out. With convenience comes a price. And so try to do at least one transaction a day that you would have done in a vehicle on foot and see see what it does for you. You're going to love it. If you find it boring, and I don't think you will, but if you did find it boring, you could listen to a podcast such as The Mark Dolan Way or another preferred podcast. You could catch up on your favourite music or you could listen to an audiobook or here's something I do all the time. If I've got to make a call and I want to walk, I do both. So I'll have a hands-free walk. Sometimes I'm holding the phone, but occasionally I've just got my little headphones in and I'll have a hands-free chat which makes me look truly insane to the members of the public because they think I'm talking to myself but you kill two birds with one stone you get the stroll and you get that call out the way I mean I've done teams meetings I've done zoom calls where I just say listen I'm, I'm out and about do you mind if we just go audio only it's a great hack by the way if you do a lot of zoom calls with work ask colleagues if you can be off camera and it allows you to get up to other things such as the ironing or going for a walk or even being intimate with your partner as long as you're quiet. What's not to like? Do it, baby. Go to a football match. Go swimming with waterproof equipment. The weekly supermarket shop. You can even take a nap as long as, you know, they don't think you're asleep and you're just being a bit quiet or you're listening intently. But yeah, it's, it's a really good thing, the walking. And the other thing is getting out in nature. That's a big one. Not everyone has that luxury. You could be living in a very urban built up area. But if you can, and if it's nearby, try to just be in the green. And you hear the birds and just looking at green things, looking at the trees, looking at plants, seeing flowers, seeing weeds. It doesn't matter. Your eyes swallow it up. Your nose breathes it in. It's just a, it's a sensory experience. You can't rationalize it. There's no explaining why being out in nature is good for your mental health. It's just that when you do it, you feel way better afterwards. So see if you can include one green walk at least once a week, ideally every day, but at least once a week. Nature is there for a reason. It's the ultimate gift. Now, a couple of other things before we go. Everything in life is about communication. And where people go wrong is that they don't communicate well. So make that your superpower. This program is about putting you in the top 5%. And let me tell you that the top 5% communicate well. So if you're at work and there's a work issue, send an email, speak to your line manager. Or um, if you feel like it's not significant, but it's still bothering you, Take a note of it. So keep a little diary of issues, right? So let's say that there's somebody at work and they're just not treating you very well. And you write down what's happened, okay? You take a note of it. And then hopefully that was a one-off because they were in a bad mood and they've had an argument with their wife and that's why they were horrible to you. And then they're never horrible again and it was nothing to worry about. You didn't need to raise it. But then it happens again and again. It's a pattern of things. 
And you write down, and you go, well, well, Bob said this on Tuesday, and then on Thursday this happened, then on a Monday this happened. And that's the point we go, well, look, we, we, we've got a problem here. We've got a trend. This keeps happening. Bob's being very annoying. And that's when you go to your land manager and you say, look, I'm really happy. Always start with the positive, by the way. If you've, if you've got bad news for people, start with the positive. Um, Gordon Brown was famous for needing bad news in a good news sandwich. So they'd say, hey, Gordon Brown, prime minister, inflation's down. Um there's going to be a national strike and uh, you've just won a by-election. So they would they would give him two bits of good news with the bad news in the middle. That's not a bad way to, to do it at work or indeed in a relationship. So you start with the positive. I'm really happy here. I'm having a great time. Um, we're, we're, uh, our numbers are, are growing. My department's delivering. Everything's good. However, I've got an issue with Bob. Da, 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 da. And you just communicate. Now, what's the worst that can happen? The worst that can happen is they can say, well, um, you're talking out of your backside. Bob's great. Shut up. Okay. And that's fine. You've, you've said your piece. It's unlikely they'll react in that way. Probably what they'll do is they will have a think about it and then offer you some support and maybe speak to Bob. But what you've done is you've communicated. Bob's not treating you well. <clears throat> By the way, something I, I would suggest, if we're going to communicate, maybe start with Bob. OK, so Bob's been annoying maybe two or three times. You say, hey, Bob, remember the sandwich. Remember the Dolan sandwich, right? Hey, Bob, really like working with you. I'm a fan. But you've made a few remarks recently. I don't enjoy it. Do you mind not? OK, now that's incredible because you've shown great confidence there. If Bob was a bully, that would probably freak him out because bullies don't like it when you confront them and when you address their bullying. Now, Bob, at that point, he's got two options. He can say, oh, I'm really sorry. Thank you for telling me. Oh, I'll definitely make sure I don't. I, I didn't intend to be rude, but I can understand why that might be perceived that way. And I'm really sorry and I won't do it again. And then, you know, you and Bob are going to just like the best ever friends. But how did that happen? It only happened because you reached out to Bob. You communicated. I don't like these remarks you make. I know it's banter. I know it's just your sense of humor, but it's not for me. You've given Bob a chance. You've given Bob an opportunity to be better and to change. OK, and a lot of times, oftentimes, as the Americans say, by the way, we've got a lot of uh, listeners in America and I love America very much. Got family there. American comedy, American music, you name it. But can I just tell you, my lovely American friends, that oftentimes is not a goddamn word. OK. It just isn't. Oftentimes, by the way, often will do. Oh, you don't need often. You don't have to glue the word times to the word often. Often is enough. Anyway, uh, often that will work if you just go straight to the, the person that you've got an issue with. And then what happens is that if he's a bit not very nice and he sort of says, yeah, I'll change, but he doesn't, or he just laughs at you or he ignores you, well, that's when you can escalate it to management. But at least you've communicated with him. You've given him a chance and then when management come to him, at least he can't complain because you went to him first and in a way you came in peace and you offered him the opportunity to settle out of court. You know, you gave him the chance to to um, address this thing without any repercussions, without management even knowing about this. And that's the magic of communication. But either way, you're in a strong position. Either way, you're protected. It's a beautiful thing. And it's the same in relationships. You've got to communicate. We don't we don't communicate. We're polite to each other, even our closest, our nearest and dearest. But you're not doing your mum, your dad, your husband, your wife, your boyfriend, your girlfriend. You're not doing them any favours by putting up with stuff and hiding your emotions and being unhappy, but pretending that everything's fine. You're not helping them because all it's going to do is fester and get toxic and build up and it's going to explode like a volcano and then you'll say something really horrible and you'll be ultra nasty causing a lot of damage and really it was your failure to communicate which led to this disruption so instead what you want if you think of it as a volcano what you want is lots and lots and loads of mini eruptions okay so you want to fire that volcano on a daily basis so that all it is is like a puff of smoke, a puff of warm smoke rather than miles of molten lava. 
And therefore, in your relationship, you know, let's say that your partner is just very messy with the tea bags, and you just say, by the way, I really don't like it when you're messy with the tea bags. You've communicated, you've given them the opportunity to change rather than tolerate the tea bag chaos. And then you tolerate the wet towel on the bed, and then you tolerate this, and then you tolerate that. And then there's the most almighty and very destructive row after six months. Let it, you know, have the mini rant every day. We should work on this for the show as well. But I wonder whether um, you need something like, with your partner, you need something like 10 minutes a day of talk time. Okay, I will call that. We just invented that, by the way. You're welcome. Talk time where you just, in a really focused way, communicate. So sort of 10 minutes of concentrated, intensive communication. And they get five minutes each. You get five minutes and you go, right, well, yesterday you flirted with the neighbor and um, I asked you to take the washing out of the washing machine. It stayed in the washing machine wet and it's now smelly. And you're supposed to call your brother Steve and you haven't yet. Now he's pestering me. And you, you go through, I don't think you need examples. I think you're quite clever. I think you know what I'm saying. So I won't offer you any more improvised examples of bad things a partner can do. But... You feel better because you've got it off your chest. And the other person is able to hear this and go, well, I can fix that. I can fix that. And I can fix that. But there's only one crucial golden rule. It's Dolan's golden rule. It's got to be two ways. It can't just be that. It can't be that Bobby is, is the bad one who has to say, you know, has to basically get shouted at for 10 minutes. And then and then Edna, I just I have got no young women's names. I'm really sorry. Edna is so perfect and she doesn't, you know what I mean? There's nothing wrong with Edna. It does not work like that, okay? Each partner gets to be told off for five minutes each. But it's not told off, it's just communication because no one's perfect and there are always problems and there's always friction and you just talk it out. So what about that? 10 minutes of talk time a day. And if you can't manage that, 10 minutes a week, let's start from small little what's-its and grow. But communication is everything. It is a superpower. Uh, you look at people in business and they communicate, they communicate their vision. Watch Steve Jobs, right? The late founder of Apple. When he presents, when he did present before he sadly died, the latest Apple model. And he just communicated so well the qualities of this product and Apple's brand values. He communicated. So work on your communication. You know, when you're in a meeting, have bullet points. Think in advance what you're going to say in the meeting. And then communicate those as well as you can. So you've prepared, you've thought it through. You've got bullet points as a, an aid memoir, a little reminder. You go into the meeting and you go, right, we've got to improve marketing. And here's why. Bang, bang, bang. And we've got to improve customer service. And here's why. Bang, bang, bang. And we've got to look at pricing because customers are finding the product is, is a little too much for them. We've got to see how we can value engineer. Bang, 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 bang. Right. And people are like, what the hell? That is amazing. She is so focused that... Uh, um, Esmeralda, right? Esmeralda is so focused and on it. Bang, bang. It's not rich. She's not more on it than anyone else. She's learned the art of communication. It's a superpower. You get other people in meetings and they just waffle on, don't they? Waffle, waffle, waffle. More words than you need. Less is more. Communication, folks. Brevity is the soul of wit. I think that brings us to the end of the show. Um, I've really... Thoroughly enjoyed your company. I'm going to leave you with a golden nugget. I, I think this might be the best thing that you've ever had in the podcast. It's been a long, very chatty podcast today. I've loved having your company, by the way. It's always, it's an ongoing joy. If you're enjoying the show, tell your friends, tell your family, and let's change the world together. You're welcome. Like and subscribe, I think it's probably a good thing to do. Maybe give an honest review on your preferred podcast platform. Remember, you can watch the show on YouTube. Every episode is on YouTube. You can actually see this. Um, I'm going to leave you with what I think might be the best thing ever. I mean, I think the best thing we've ever done so far was do bad work as a motivational tool, which I'm never going to tire of telling you, which is if you struggle to get things done, if you're a procrastinator, um, make a deal with yourself to do it badly because then there's no pressure and then you'll do it. And then when you do it, it turns out it was quite good. Uh, that's the magic of, of do it badly. But I've got another one for you and it's um, maybe a, a similar flavor, but it's it's slightly different. 
And this is to do with those tasks that you're putting off that you don't fancy. And it's, um, I've invented this. How many words is it? It's four words. Give it five seconds. Okay. I think we've heard of try something for like 11 minutes or there's different time windows, aren't there? But on Mark Dolan, the Mark Dolan way, be good if I could remember the name of the show, wouldn't it? It's got my name in and I still got the name wrong. You're welcome. Plus we've done 22 episodes. The Mark Dolan way is what it's called. Although I do think I should have called it the 5% because that's what this show is about is getting you in the top 5%, but it hasn't got my name in. I'm a massive egomaniac. What are you going to do? Mark Dolan's 5%. Listen, let's don't fix it. If it ain't broke, baby, it's called, I think it's called the Mark Dolan way. Give it five seconds is four words. Give it five seconds. So let's say it's a company report you cannot face. Okay. Switch on your laptop and just give it five seconds. If it's a text to your auntie Beryl, see that is an old lady's name and it's an auntie who would be older anyway. So that actually works. So I think I got away with that one. Um, you got to text auntie Beryl. You don't want to text auntie Beryl. Give it five seconds. You don't want to clean the car. You don't want to empty the bins. You don't want to fill out your tax return. You don't want to read that rather dry book. You don't want to do some weeding in the garden. You don't want to get dressed. <laughs> you don't want this. You don't want that. I don't think you need examples. I think you, you're quite smart. I think you can imagine what I'm saying here. Give it five seconds. Okay. So with, with Auntie Auntie Beryl, you pick up your phone. It's five seconds, right? And you go, dear Auntie Beryl. And what happens is, and here's the magic, is that once you start typing, it turns out you've started. You have begun. You won't stop. The company report, I don't fancy it. Turn the laptop on, give it five seconds. And you go, this company report, suddenly you're three seconds in, right? You're not going to stop at five. The hardest thing is to start. And that's why give it five seconds is so magic. You're going to think it's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. It doesn't matter. It works. It bloody works. It's amazing. You are welcome. So that's it, folks. Um, that is the show. Give it five seconds. I promise you. It doesn't matter what the task is. Wedding planning, um, colonic irrigation, anything, anything, baby. Give it five seconds because it's a mechanism. It's a hack that I can't lie. I've literally invented in order to get you started because getting started is the hardest thing. By the way, finishing is hard, too, because I could talk to you all day. Um, it's been a delight and I can't wait to see you in a week's time on, I'm pretty sure it's called The Mark Dolan Way. Bye-bye.